a do-over. Uh, <laughs> Are they talking to me? No, I can Hi, can you hear me? Thank you. I heard. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. On the show tonight. We're going to start the process extremely soon and we'll have a nominee very soon. Two former Supreme Court clerks on the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the political standoff it sparked before the election. She's young, she's written a lot, she's successful. A look at a potential successor to Justice Ginsburg who has local connections. The path forward for Albany Park after a surge of violence. There was a silent pandemic happening before COVID-19. Worsening existing disparities. Six months into the pandemic, food insecurity is on the rise, including among children. Puerto Rico is still struggling three years after Hurricane Maria. We check in with residents who came to Chicago escaping the devastation. The old post office debuts a massive new rooftop space, but could the pandemic affect its leases with high profile tenants? I'm hoping that I'm bringing something to school children that they couldn't get from their school. And how a Chicago architect is inspiring the next generation of artists. But first, some of today's top stories. This morning, Senator Dick Durbin laid out what it would take for Democrats to halt Senator Mitch McConnell's effort to vote on a new justice before Election Day. Can he be stopped? Well, it takes four Republican senators to step forward and say they are not going along with Senator McConnell. That's what it takes. We can delay him, slow it down, do this, do that. Ultimately, unless four Republican senators are people of principle, who are honest and people of integrity, we're going to be faced with this filling of this vacancy. So far, two Republican senators have come out in support of waiting to fill Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat. Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska and Senator Susan Collins of Maine. Durbin says of McConnell's actions in 2016, compared to today, are hypocritical when he blocked President Obama from filling a court vacancy 11 months before the presidential election. And we'll have more on Justice Ginsburg and the future of the court in just a few minutes. Illinois has reached a testing milestone, surpassing 5 million COVID-19 tests since the beginning of the pandemic, making it one of the first states in the nation to do so. These nation-leading accomplishments have allowed Illinoisans to do what most states can't. There's a testing location and testing available for you if you feel you need one. And you can get one even without a doctor's order. For families, businesses, schools, and churches, that means there's a measure of safety here in Illinois that doesn't exist in most other states. On average, the state has the capacity to perform 52,000 tests a day. Compared to the rest of the country, the Department of Health says Illinois ranks third in the number of daily tests over the last week behind California and New York. Meanwhile, the Illinois Department of Public Health confirms more than 1,400 new cases of the coronavirus, plus seven additional deaths. This brings a statewide case total to more than 275,000 cases and over 8,400 deaths. The iconic Lowry's The Prime Rib will be closing after 46 years of service. The restaurant says they plan on making the most out of its last few months with private tours, holiday celebrations and more. 
Its last day of service will be on December 31st. And now to Brandis and more on the aftermath of Justice Ginsburg's death. Brandis. Paris, it wasn't long after news of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg death. Ginsburg's death that the conversation turned to who will replace her on the U.S. Supreme Court. Amanda Venicky joins us now with a look at succession plans, including a judge with local ties who is in the running. Amanda. Yes, Brandis, President Donald Trump has already nominated two justices to the nation's high court. That's Justices Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh. And he promises that he will unveil his third nominee within days. Now, we can't know who he'll choose, but he has said this much. I will be putting forth a nominee next week. It will be a woman. Ginsburg, of course, was the second woman ever to be on the United States Supreme Court, and she was known for her advocacy for gender equality and for women's rights. One of the women on Trump's shortlist is Judge Amy Coney Barrett, who Trump in 2017 nominated for her current position as a circuit judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit that is based in Chicago. Barrett reportedly visited the White House today. She graduated law school from Notre Dame in neighboring Indiana and went on to be part of the law faculty there. Northwestern University's Daniel Rodriguez says he doesn't know Barrett well, but he says they have met a few times through legal professor circles. She's uh, written quite a bit and, and uh, I, I share, uh, echo the view that many others have said, which is she is a, uh, was an accomplished legal scholar before she, before she was appointed uh, to, to the bench a very uh, distinctive uh, uh, and strong perspectives and points of view on a number of issues of, uh, of law. Uh, uh, folks who know her better than I do, including those who are her colleagues on the Notre Dame faculty, say she's a person of enormous integrity. Rodriguez says those legal writings will be heavily scrutinized should Barrett be Trump's nominee, something that given Barrett's avowed Catholic faith, may energize President Trump's base. Rodriguez says, given her short time on the federal appellate bench, there's not all that much to glean about her track record there and how it could translate to the U.S. Supreme Court should she be appointed to it. Moreover, he says, the, case, the cases that she has dealt with there haven't been of the blockbuster variety. What's ever on everyone's mind is certainly how she might approach issues involving abortion rights. And while there are certainly significant tea leaves, there is no evidence from her decisions on the U.S. Court of Appeals in that area, or frankly, in many other hot button areas that would uh, that would explain it. He says that relative lack of track record could cut both ways. It could be reassuring to some and then less so that want to be sure that a conservative is appointed to the court. One thing he can say about Barrett is that she has judicial restraint. She is, uh, to use the, the phrase du jour, an originalist. Uh, so much like Justice, uh, the late Justice Scalia, and even those justices on the court now, like Justice Kavanaugh, uh, Gorsuch, and, uh, and Justice Alito and Thomas, the, uh, the so-called conservatives on the court, she believes in uh, methods of interpretation that accord significance to the original meaning of the Constitution. Now, Northern Illinois University's Artemis Ward points out that Barrett did clerk for the late Justice Scalia. She's also a member of the Federalist Society, both of which, he says, could put her in Trump's favor. There's another major factor at play, her age. And she's young. You know, she's, she's going to be 49 years old. Um, and, and you want to always look for a nominee who's young because of this life tenure issue, right? They're going to serve for life. She's going to outlive us. She's going to be on the Supreme Court forever, right? Should she be confirmed for the rest of our lives? This is a huge deal. In other words, Trump will have a legacy on the court long after he's president, regardless of what happens in November. Ward is an advocate for term limits on the U.S. Supreme Court. He literally wrote the book on it and says that the nation's founders never imagined or intended for lifetime appointments to work like this. He says 
were it for term limits, perhaps presidents would pick brilliant legal minds who've had long careers to build esteemed legal records. Think like Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. Instead, Ward says, because of this politicized appointment process, presidents are choosing you know, capable attorneys, but they are technocratic judges. And he puts Barrett in that camp. Absolutely. I mean, she's, you know, she's, she's young, she's written a lot, she's successful, but there are plenty of uh, sitting judges on the Court of Appeals who are 20 years older than her, who have amassed an amazing record and who would uh, can be considered fantastic Supreme Court picks, um, perhaps even acceptable to both liberals and conservatives because of the, perhaps their moderate philosophies, but because they're so well respected, so well esteemed, they belong on the Supreme Court, but they'll never get nominated because they're way too old. He also says that staggered set terms would have meant that Ginsburg needn't have worried about her successor on her deathbed. He says Ginsburg gambled that Hillary Clinton would beat Donald Trump and she lost that gamble. Brenda, back to you. Amanda, thank you. And now to Paris and more on Justice Gin Ginsburg's legacy on the court, Paris. Brandis, the death of Supreme Court Associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is shaping up to be a flashpoint that could reverberate for generations. Ginsburg is being memorialized all across the ideological spectrum as an icon whose life was tirelessly devoted to the advancement of gender equality, civil rights, and the pursuit of justice. But her death has also been met with fierce political posturing with lawmakers and the president wasting no time outlining what they plan to do with that newly vacated seat. I think it's going to move very quickly, actually. I agree with the statement put out by Mitch McConnell. Uh, I agree with it, actually, 100 percent. I put out a very similar statement, you saw. So I think we're going to start the process extremely soon, and we'll have a nominee very soon. Joining us now with more are David Franklin, associate professor of law at DePaul University. Franklin clerked for Justice Ginsburg. And Carolyn Shapiro, a professor of law at the Illinois Institute of Technology's Chicago Kent College of Law. Shapiro is the founder and director of the school's Institute on the Supreme Court of the United States and clerked for Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer. Welcome both of you back. Uh, David Franklin, I want to start uh, with you since, since you did know her fairly well. What was your reaction last Friday upon hearing about the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Well, it's devastating on many levels. Um, hers was a historic life, um, a life very well lived. She accomplished so much. Frankly, if she had never become a judge or a justice, she still would have been remembered as probably the most important advocate for uh, women's rights in the justice system um, in, in our history. Um, but the timing of all of this, you know, just several weeks shy of an election uh, makes it uh, all the more heart-wrenching, and I'm, I'm really frightened, frankly, for what our country's about to go through. And Karen Shapiro, you know, sticking on the legacy, we've all sat here and talked about her legacy. Just a, a month ago, we, we, we did a segment on it. Let's focus on one aspect of it, her dissenting opinions in, in recent years. She had said she'd hoped that they might provide guidance for future courts, even though she was on the, the losing side of, of many opinions. What were some of those dissents, and how could they provide future guidance? Well, for example, one of those dissents is in a case called Shelby County versus Holder, and, and that's a case where the court in a 5-4 decision struck down a key provision of the Voting Rights Act. And it's a key provision of the Voting Rights Act that, had, that by striking it down immediately has allowed all kinds of voter suppression uh, me methods to go into effect without any meaningful check, which is exactly what she predicted in her opinion. Um, and her opinion explained why it, it, the C Congress's choice to require states with a history of discriminatory voting practices to have, be, have the, their voting changes approved by the federal government was precisely what needed to happen to protect the right to vote. David Franklin, uh, you know, could, could that dissenting opinion how could it guide future courts, uh, depending on what the makeup is going to be 10, 20, 30 years down the road? Well, you know, she often was speaking not just to future courts, Paris, but also to future lawyers in, in, in the form of today's law students and to the general public and, and, and also to Congress. Uh, one of her most famous dissents came in the Lily Ledbetter case um, having to do with uh, equal pay 
Um, and she said, the ball is now in Congress's court. Uh, and that was a time when we still had a responsive functional Congress, barely. Um, and the, they, they uh, responded um, by changing the law. Um, it's a lot harder uh, in, in a case like Shelby County that Carolyn was describing uh, because that was a constitutional decision uh, that really hamstrung uh, the Congress. And that's what this conservative majority on the court is so often doing, uh, preventing the democratic process from uh, vindicating the rights that we all should enjoy. And, and you alluded to this earlier, David Franklin, as you both know, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell four years ago refused to hold confirmation hearings for then President Obama's choice of Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court, saying it was too close to an election, closer to an election this time, but he says it's a different ball game. Let's hear what McConnell had to say. The American people reelected our majority in 2016. They strengthened it further in 2018 because we pledged to work with President Trump on the most critical issues facing our country. The federal judiciary was right at the top of the list. Carolyn Shapiro, obviously very strong sentiments felt uh, by a lot of people that this move is blatant hypocrisy. But from a legal point of view, is there anything troubling to you about having a confirmation process while an election for president is underway, given what McConnell said four years ago about not confirming someone or hearing uh, anyone in an election year? The, the Constitution only requires the Senate itself to, to consent, but the Constitution is just a structure. It, it, it lays out the outer bounds. If we're going to have a functioning democracy, we need to have people who are willing occasionally to say the process matters. And even if the Constitution doesn't require a particular process, our de democracy just will not function if people try to take full advantage every time they hold the power and entrench themselves further in power, which is, in my view, what Mitch McConnell did in 2016 and is threatening to do now. And David Franklin, the, the um, reasoning that McConnell uses is that in 2016, the executive branch and the Senate were two different political parties. This year, it's the same political party, and so it's a different precedent. Does that argument hold any muster? Is that a serious question, Paris? It's a joke. I mean, it would be funny if it weren't so sad. It's blatant hypocrisy. Uh, my pointing it out won't change that. Um, the lack of shame of the GOP leadership and of, of Mr. McConnell uh, prevent any charges of hypocrisy, uh, hypocrisy from, from sticking uh, or, or mattering. Um, but of course, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous argument. All right, we're going to have, you know, yeah, go ahead, Carolyn, go ahead. Sorry. You know, it only takes four Republican senators to agree that the process matters and that our democratic, small d, democratic respect for each other and traditions should, should matter and not to allow this to go forward. Whereas in 2016, it was solely up to McConnell. He simply decided not to move forward. It's a little different this time. All right, we're going to have more on this uh, in just a bit later in the show. We'll be joined again by Carolyn Shapiro and David Franklin to discuss some of the politics around this issue right now. But for now, my thanks to you both. And now to Brandis and a look at violence in the Albany Park neighborhood. Brandis. Paris, thank you. Chicago's Albany Park neighborhood on the city's northwest side is grappling with a spike in violent crime. In 2020, reported shootings have more than doubled in the 17th police district, which includes the neighborhood, compared to this time last year, according to police data. Chicago Police Superintendent David Brown said today that more police resources are coming to the community in response to the shootings. Internal gang conflicts and external is what we're seeing in the 17th district and we dedicated additional resources. But some residents say instead of more cops, the city should fund additional social services in the area. Joining us with more are Misha Mann, co-founder and member of the Northwest Safety Coalition, which is comprised of neighborhood groups in the area, and Maria Elena Cifuentes, an Albany Park resident and board president at Communities United, a community group based in the neighborhood. Welcome both of you to Chicago tonight. Maria Elena, let's start with you, please. So as we mentioned, Albany Park has seen this surge in shootings this year, uh, including seven in just three days last week. How's the community coping with this aftermath? Well, coping, I guess it's uh, not easy. Um, a lot of people are scared. Um, they want to know what's going on and why this is happening. Uh, let's just say, what is the cause, the root cause of it? Um, and I, 
I believe a lot of it has to do with um, just people aren't going to call the police right now because they don't trust them. Uh, and I want to want to come back to that mention of people not calling the police and, and trust. Uh, but Misha Mann, your coalition is calling for more police officers to be dedicated to the 17th district in your neighborhood, uh, which has seen fluctuating staffing levels. How, how do you think that'll help the issue? Right. And just to clarify, we're not asking for more. We're ac asking for ac equitable staffing. Um, we want to get back to the levels that we're supposed to be at and be comparable to other districts. Um, we want to make sure that the um, CPD members that are assigned to the 17th stay in the 17th and aren't redirected on, on their shifts. Um, and then we also hope that because there is a special influx right now of gang violence, that that can be addressed with uh, tactical and gang, gang um, uh, resources. Um, but overall, we just want to build a base and we also hope that by keeping these officers in the community, they can begin to build relationships with the community members so there's more trust. They need uh, to know the neighborhood, they need to know the people. And you say you wanted to get back to equitable staffing numbers uh, where the previous numbers of staffing of police in the community, why were these officers redirected to other assignments? You know, I think it depends on what time of the year, it, it, but the pandemic, looting, um, there's been so many different events where they've been redirected. Uh, and I know all areas of the city are important, but we feel obligated to fight for our own neighborhoods because we live here. And many of us not only live here, but we work here. Maria Elena, do you think that more police there in your community, do you think that's the answer to some of these issues? Uh, actually, no, it isn't. Um, Again, it has to do with the trust. Uh, if you put more police, again, they're still not trust, people are still not gonna trust them. Uh, so that's not gonna help. Um, I believe that, um, like uh, Ms. Mann said, it, it has to be uh, communication and awareness as to who, who are the problems in, in the neighborhood. Uh, we, we have to, meet these police officers we they have to get to know us we need to know who they are in order for us to be able to trust them and misha man you know we just heard obviously maria elena other community members also think that you know police would only having more police would only exacerbate the problem uh but that additional resources like social workers and other investments should be deployed what do you make of that argument oh it's just one part of a multifaceted need. We can't solve this problem with any one solution. And that's what's clear. It takes, um, it's going to take all resources. It's going to take all types of people to be involved from community members to our political leaders, um, to our social services resources, to CPD. This is just step one. We have to get people to stop shooting so then we can start to address the root cause. And Misha, your coalition also helped to organize a peace march uh, that happened in the neighborhood on Sunday. What were you all hoping to accomplish there? Well, uh, one of our um, member organizations is called Israel's Gift of Hope. And unfortunately, that foundation was started because they did lose a family member to gun violence. And they did start uh, the peace march. And one of the reasons they did so is to take another step and get some visibility in the community on this issue. Um, some people aren't aware, some people aren't on social media, so they're not seeing all the messaging that's going out about the violence. They might hear it, but they might not know what's going on and what's being done about it. So the march was to raise awareness. And I think one of the things that's very clear is how much can be accomplished when we get together to work on something. Um, we've had great success just start from a single email or a single phone call. And Maria Elena, in your work with Communities United, do you see a connection between the realities of the pandemic and this increase in violence? Um, well, we, we were actually trying to help, have we help try to get jobs for the young people. And just with the pandemic, it's really hard to just get the, the, our youth out there to work uh, because a lot of places are closing or are cutting hours. So it kind of interrupts what we, some of the work we're doing. Um, and in just a few seconds left, Maria Elena, how can community groups and the city work together um, to address some of the root causes of violence, like absence of employment, for example? 
Uh, it's kind of hard because, uh, like I said, a lot of people uh, are, are very scared of what's going on. Uh, they don't want to come out. They don't want to uh, be exposed. So just, I guess we're trying to do our best, but it's really hard with the pandemic and uh, a lot of the regulations that the city has put. Okay, so a lot of lot of uh, work cut out for you, it sounds like. Best of luck to you both, and thanks for joining us, uh, Maria Elena Cifuentes and Misha Mann. Up next, food insecurity on the rise amid COVID-19. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the City Club of Chicago. Smart people may disagree about what makes a great city, but part of what makes Chicago great is that we don't have to agree. To run a city like ours, a lot of issues come up. The City Club of Chicago is a place to debate those issues and hear from the men and women who shape the policies, lead the industries, and tell the stories that define our city. For the free and open exchange of ideas, the City Club of Chicago. Food insecurity is on the rise as the country faces its sixth month in a pandemic as some households struggle to afford food. Survey data from the Census Bureau shows that one in 10 Americans don't have enough food and that food insufficiency among children has risen over the summer. And here in Chicago, 17% of households say they can't afford to pay for both their bills and food, according to an NPR poll. This as the virus continues to exacerbate already existing inequities here and around the country. Joining us now to discuss how COVID-19 has impacted food security in Chicago are Angela Odoms Young, an associate professor of kinesiology and nutrition at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and Nicole Robinson, vice president of community impact at the Greater Chicago Food Depository. So first, Nicole, let's start with you, please. How have you seen food insecurity in Chicago change during the pandemic? Thank you, Brandis, for having me. and. Uh, thank you for lifting up actually the, the report around the data. And I, I want to add a little bit of twist to that is what we knew about communities on the south and west side of the city is there was a silent pandemic happening before COVID-19. And what this public health crisis did was shine a really big light on it. Uh, there were communities across Chicago with high rates of unemployment, double digit, the double digit that we're seeing today, uh, high rates of chronic health conditions, uh, large life expectancy gaps. Actually, the city of Chicago just released the Chicago 2025, Healthy Chicago 2025 report, which highlights uh, those disparities. So we are seeing that from a food insecurity perspective because when people uh, cannot pay their bills, uh, that's a challenge. And what the NPR report also lifts up is that 69% of African Americans and 63% of Latino Americans report a financial challenge. And uh, we all have gotten sort of financial advice around having three months of savings and what that really means. But and Nicole, I, I imagine this means, though, that you've probably seen an increased need at the food depository. We absolutely have, and we've seen that reflected in the number of individuals that show up at soup kitchens, pantries, and shelters, and we've seen a 120% increase since and, January. And Angela, we've, you know, we've already seen that black and brown communities have been disproportionately affected by uh, the virus. Um, how are they also disproportionately affected by food insecurity? As Nicole mentioned, so we have known for many years over the years, we've seen a decline in food insecurity before this. COVID, in a sense, is an exception where we're seeing this increase. But one thing that we have not seen change, even over many years, is that gap, that racial and ethnic gap in food insecurity. That's persisted for many years. And now with COVID, it's just exacerbated. As Nicole mentioned, that we know communities on the South and West Side we have that historic disadvantage and historic disinvestment. So when you lay a pandemic on top of that, already we have a wealth gap, already we have an investment gap, a resource gap, an opportunities gap, it just becomes wider. So that's one reason why we see that disproportionate impact on black and brown communities. Black and brown uh, communities are more likely to not be able to work from home, to be 
in those types of positions. They're more likely to be frontline workers, to be in jobs that might be precarious where you think about work uh, that might be, when we think about part-time jobs or jobs that are not salaried. So really, we, we think COVID, 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 we think this new, you know, COVID is new, COVID has been since March, but there's already this silent uh, pandemic on top of, uh, you know, the silent pandemic of disadvantage already. And then COVID is on top of that. And Nicole, you know, I think we all know, unfortunately, this pandemic is not going away anytime soon. I imagine that means that the need uh, for the people that you serve will continue to increase. It, it will, and uh, the pandemic has surely tested what we're able to do. We, we have about 700 programs and partnerships across Cook County, uh, soup kitchens, pantry shelters, where individuals and families can go to seek out food assistance. As Angela remarked, there are, are folks who are new to the emergency food system and are new to turning to a pantry. There's something called the Supplemental Nutrition Assistant Program called SNAP, where consumers can go into a grocery store and buy what they need. Those programs have been expanded considerably uh, throughout the pandemic, but there's uncertainty about how long that will continue. How long will pe people continue to be able to receive SNAP? And we've really had to ramp up our e uh, efforts at the food depository by getting more food, creating new partnerships, uh, because there's also a gap around trust. There's a gap around community trust, whether it's in the healthcare system, uh, the economic system, and we were trying to build trust in our emergency food system, at least stronger trust, which is why we partnered with black and brown organizations who were trusted people on the ground who know the communities, who could ask them what they needed and want it and actually connect them to food. And that and, has been a big part of our strategy. And Angela, before we run out of time, about 30 seconds left, what are some of the long-term consequences of food insecurity? The long-term consequences so we have at the individual level and household level, particularly the impact on children. So when you think about healthy growth and development, food is a big part of that, diet is a big part of that. And so um, food insecurity can have a detrimental impact on normal development. It also can have a detrimental impact when we think about chronic disease management. Much of chronic disease management is diet. So our leading conditions are diet related, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. So many of those conditions have a key dietary component. When you're food insecure or you feel like you're gonna, you're worrying and you don't have money to buy, uh, but you, you won't that have enough money to buy right. more food. That increased stress you, level can obviously Exactly, yeah, so we to... have stress. We know stress is related to diabetes, right. self-management, as well as diet itself. You've got a lot to say about this. You spend a lot of time uh, working on it, but uh, I think we're out of time, though. I do want to extend my thanks again, of course, to Angela Odoms-Young and Nicole Robinson. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, the old post office debuts a massive new rooftop space, but could the pandemic affect its leases with high profile tenants? Checking in with residents who came to Chicago three years ago while escaping Hurricane Maria. And details about a virtual art class for young aspiring architects. But first, back to Paris for some more of today's top stories. Paris. That's right, Brandis. Some cannabis dispensary applicants that lost out on a state license may now have a second chance. That's because the Pritzker administration is revising some of the rules for dispensary licenses to ensure that the process is fair and equitable. After meeting with community leaders and stakeholders, the administration is creating some additional steps to the process. Applicants who didn't get a perfect score of 252 points before will now be able to receive a score sheet showing where they lost those points and then they can either amend their application or request a rescore if they think regulators got it wrong the first time. The Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Reg Regulation received over 2,500 cannabis dispensary applications to ultimately go into a lottery that would award 75 new licenses. Some Chicago public school teachers say they want more input in remote learning plans. Chicago Teachers Union leadership says CPS needs to better tailor student schedules to reduce screen time. CTU is also asking for clinicians to be allowed to do more work from home to limit the number of people who are in school buildings on a daily basis.
And just in time for the cooling weather, city officials have released new guidelines designed to help restaurants and bars serve people outside in the fall and winter months. Eateries that have a sidewalk cafe permit, outdoor patio license, or are part of an expanded outdoor dining area can keep serving diners outside. Restaurants can set up tents to keep customers warm as long as 50% of sides of the tents are open to allow airflow. And heaters can be used provided they don't pose a fire hazard and are properly ventilated and operated. And city officials have yet to announce the winners of the city's winter design challenge that called on people to submit innovative yet feasible solutions for outdoor dining during winter. Officials also warned that they might shut down outdoor operations during weather like snow or windstorms. Illinois has reached a testing milestone, surpassing 5 million COVID-19 tests since the beginning of the pandemic, making it one of the first states in the nation to do so. These nation-leading accomplishments have allowed Illinoisans to do what most states can't. There's a testing location and testing available for you if you feel you need one. And you can get one even without a doctor's order. For families, businesses, schools, and churches, that means there's a measure of safety here in Illinois that doesn't exist in most other states. On average, the state has the capacity to perform 52,000 tests a day. Compared to the rest of the country, the Department of Health says Illinois ranks third in the number of daily tests over the last week behind California and New York. Meanwhile, the Illinois Department of Public Health confirms more than 1,400 new cases of the coronavirus, plus seven additional deaths. This brings the statewide case total to more than 275,000 cases and over 8,400 deaths. The old post office debuts a massive rooftop park and a portion of a Chicago based bank is saying goodbye. Here to go behind the headlines is Crane Chicago business reporter Danny Eckerd. The old post office building, major renovation as we've talked about for years here. You got a, a preview of the new massive rooftop garden there. What did you find? Yeah, it's very impressive. Uh, three and a half acres on the rooftop of the old post office. And so it spans three city blocks. It's got a basketball court and paddle tennis and, you know, it's got a, a running and walking track. It's a really striking backdrop for what is a, just a massive rooftop deck. And this is something that the developer uh, that, you know, overhauled the, the old post office into a modern office building is hoping will be a differentiator. They've already leased up 80% of the building. They've got big tenants there, including uh, Uber and Walgreens and Ferrara Candy and others. And, uh, you know, now, of course, it's uh, unlike last year when they were on fire when it came to leasing, the downtown office market has changed because of COVID. Uh, there's a lot more options out there for tenants, and they're hoping that this big rooftop park is a nice differentiator for them. So developers have to do things like that to sweeten the pot for businesses. All right, lastly, Chicago-based Byline Bank, it's announcing it's shuttering 20% of its branches here. What's happening? Uh, well, COVID is happening. <laughs> um, you know, Byline basically said the pandemic has changed consumer behavior. Uh, it's accelerated digital banking, things like that. So they don't need as much real estate and they don't need as uh, as, as many branches. They're looking to cut costs. Uh, Byline said it'll save them about $4.3 million a year. And, um, you know, they don't know exactly where uh, all these branch closures are going to happen, but uh, about half of their branches are in Chicago. And it's likely not the last of these we're going to see. I mean, PNC Bank, so they're going to close uh, 300 branches over the next, uh, you know, through through the end of 2021. So, you know, there's just a lot of a reevaluation of what real estate needs banks uh, have. A lot of downsizing happening, at least for the brick and mortar uh, bank branches. All right, Danny Ecker, thank you so much. Thanks, Paris. And we're right back with more right after this. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. Early in the program, our guests talked about Justice Ginsburg's legacy on the Supreme Court and joining us once again to talk about the impact of Ginsburg's vacant seat and subsequent posturing for power are two former law clerks of Supreme Court Justices, Carolyn Shapiro and David Franklin. Welcome back. And I want to start here uh, with a soundbite from presidential candidate on the Democratic ticket, Joe Biden. He and all Democrats have called on the Senate to hold off on the confirmation process. Can't unring the bell. Having made this their standard when it served their interests, they cannot just four years later change course 
when it doesn't serve their ends. All right, Kellen Shapiro, you talked about this early in the program, that it takes four GOP senators to either vote a nominee down or to vote not to have uh, confirmation hearings. Um, Murkowski and Collins, those are two that have already said they believe it should wait until the next president. Uh, is, is there an appeal that, that, that could be made to two more senators, do you believe? Well, I certainly think so. The, the Senate has a tradition of respect across the aisle. We certainly haven't seen that in recent years. But again, we can't function as a democracy if we don't respect the, the people who we, uh, we might not always agree with, who are not sometimes willing to work with them. This kind of scorched earth, uh, no holds barred, no matter, do whatever it takes to entrench power that we are seeing right now, that we saw in 2016 and we're seeing again with Mitch McConnell's handling of Supreme Court nominations is the opposite of that. And it's extraordinarily corrosive to our democratic principles and norms. And David Franklin, one of the things that Democrats now are talking about in retaliation, perhaps, if they win the Senate and the presidency, is the potential for court packing or expanding the Supreme Court. Talk about the precedents for that and, and what you think that fight would be like. Well, there's no requirement in the Constitution that the Supreme Court have nine seats. It, it's had a different number um, at various points in our history. It was larger than nine uh, briefly during the Civil War. It's, of course, been nine for a long time. Um, but, you know, in view of what happened to Merrick Garland in 2016 and what may happen now in 2020, I think Democrats would be well within their rights to explore uh, the option of adding some seats to the court uh, if they were in control uh, in, in Congress and, and uh, if, if Joe Biden wins the presidency. Um, but, you know, it's something they would have to do with great care because uh, if you're not careful, it could set off a sort of cycle of tit for tat where uh, if and when the Republicans were ever in control again, they could enlarge the court yet again. So I, I do think it's sort of well past the time that we, we could pretend that the Supreme Court is apolitical. Um, it's not that. It's just that the political moves that one makes with respect to the court have to be measured and strategic. Uh, but there certainly is some cause to explore that. In my and, and it's certain, it's, it's no secret that conservatives have had a litmus test here for nominees. They, they want a nominee who wants to uh, do away with Roe v. Wade or reverse the Roe v. Wade decision. Uh, Carolyn Shapiro, say it is a six to three conservative court. Is, is Roe v. Wade all but overturned? Well, I think Roe v. Wade was already uh, in great jeopardy, even with uh, Justice Ginsburg still on the court. The, the messages that we were getting from the Chief Justice was that he would be open to upholding increasingly stringent regulations, that he would be open to significantly weakening the standards that the Supreme Court put in place in the Casey decision back in the, in the early 90s. Uh, and although he voted with the four liberals to, uphold, to strike down a law out of Louisiana this spring, that was it was virtually an identical law to, stat to uh, the law that the court had struck down just a few years earlier. Uh, if he has the chance to dis make distinctions uh, between cases and, and say this law is different and this standard we're going to shift a little bit, he'll, he, he's signaled that he's more than willing to do that. So whether Roe is overturned uh, on its face with, uh, explicitly or, or chipped away at by a thousand cuts, uh, I think that uh, reproductive rights are in great danger. And David uh, Franklin, it's not just uh, reproductive rights, but uh, a lot of folks making the case for, for all kinds of legislative priorities. Uh, obviously, President Trump's administration is arguing to do away with uh, the Affordable Care Act. A six to three conservative court, does that mean the Affordable Care Act is all but gone? Um, it could mean that. The, the arguments for um, judicially abolishing the Affordable Care Act are laughably weak, and, and, and to their credit, many conservative-leaning lawyers have pointed that out. Uh, but one never knows, right? I mean, all bets are off, depending on the personnel on the court, and a whole range of other issues um, are also on the agenda, from, from voting rights to uh, environmental law to immigration, and of course, potentially, the very outcome of the 2020 election, right? Don't forget that uh, a contested election could well end up in the lap of the Supreme Court, just as it did in 2000 uh, with Bush v. Gore. Uh, and the final uh, area that I would note is there are already 
um, potentially five justices um, who are interested in undermining the modern administrative state, the notion of Congress's ability, for example, to delegate to expert bodies the ability to deal with scientific, medical, and other issues. Uh, that could be in jeopardy as well, at great risk to our uh, democracy. All right, well, I have a feeling we're going to be talking about this for a long time to come. This is certainly just the beginning of this conversation. But for now, my thanks to Carolyn Shapiro and David Franklin. Thank you. Thank you. And now to WTTW News Director and host of Chicago Tonight Latino Voices, Ugo Balta, for a conversation from Saturday's program about Puerto Rico's ongoing recovery. Since Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico three years ago, the U.S. territory has suffered greatly. Subsequent natural disasters, an ongoing financial crisis, and now the COVID-19 pandemic have all kept the island from fully recovering. This week, the Trump administration announced a $13 billion aid package for the island, and Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden released his own plan for stabilizing Puerto Rico. In Chicago, hundreds of Puerto Ricans who made the wrenching decision to leave their homes and move here after Hurricane Maria also struggle to recover. With help from the community organizations, some have thrived in their new lives, but some have found it hard to adapt. Here to talk about their, their experiences are Samantha Toledo, who also works for the PRCC as a case manager, Elizabeth Alfonso, who moved with her young daughter to Chicago after Hurricane Maria, and Natasha Brown, Director of Human Services and Housing Initiatives at the Puerto Rican Cultural Center. Welcome. Samantha, let me start with you. You were here when the hurricane struck. Can you talk about your experiences? Uh, yeah, I was in Puerto Rico when Hurricane Maria passed. Uh, what I had, what I usually try to make sure people remember is that after, before Hurricane Maria hit um, was Hurricane Irma a week before. So um, people that were in the northeastern part of the island were already affected without power, without water, even before Hurricane Maria hit. Um, there was a lot of destruction, a lot of loss. Um, people lost family members, houses. Um, it's, it's difficult to explain the struggle that ensued after the hurricane. Elizabeth, you were also there. What was different about this massive storm than others that have afflicted the, the island? I think we were not expecting it was going to be that bad. Uh, we, uh, at some point, were used to hurricanes and, and tropical storms and all of this. And even though we felt like we were prepared, we were not prepared for that. Talking about like food and how to be safe and everything. Like Puerto Rico was not ready for that even before. It's not ready now for another one. And yeah, it really hit us really bad. So I think that was like very surprising and scary. Natasha. You work with the Puerto Rican Cultural Center, helping what your organization calls climate refugees get settled. How many Puerto Ricans came to Chicago? What kind of help did they get? Well, initially we had thousands of Puerto Ricans come in through our welcoming center, but documented on the city documentation was like 978 individuals who came and resettled within, uh, within the Chicagoland area. We helped individuals with housing, getting stable, getting their medical card, getting SNAP benefits, getting clothing, helping individuals acclimate into uh, the Chicago area. You're coming from the island, you're moving here. It's a difference of clothing, getting people to um, get on their feet, you know, trying to stabilize. They're coming from an, an unfortunate situation. They're leaving their home, their country, because of a natural disaster. You know, I, I remember visiting the island on its first anniversary and just being struck at some of the areas. It looked like the hurricane had hit the day before. This week, um, the Trump administration announced a multi-billion dollar aid package that includes uh, 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 resources for energy and education systems. What do you think about, uh, about this announcement? And do you think the Trump administration did enough soon after the, the hurricane hit the island? Let's start with you, Samantha. Uh, well, I think that first of all, we need to make sure that the money's allocated correctly and that the funds are used uh, and given to the appropriate resources and to actually help the, the, the towns of Puerto Rico and for not 
and not for the administration to be keeping that money and not assisting the, the people of Puerto Rico. In regard to the Trump administration, no, I do not believe he did enough after the, the hurricane hit. Um, there was a lot of money that was funneled and uh, was not kept track of. The people were not assisted correctly after the hurricane. People were still hungry. Homes are still, to this day, not rebuilt. Um, the, the infrastructure is still not done correctly. We know that Puerto Rico has an overall score of D minus in, in their infrastructure. And none of the money that supposedly Trump gave was allocated to, uh, to any of those resources that were necessary to fix at the time. Uh, Elizabeth, you know, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, Vice President Joe Biden also came up with a package that includes uh, forgiveness of some of the debt that the island uh, has. Um, but do you think that both candidates are doing enough to win the Puerto Rican votes? Now, of course, Puerto Ricans in the island can't vote, but certainly the Puerto Ricans who live in the continental United States can vote. Do you think both candidates are doing enough to garner their, their support? It's, it's hard to say. I, I don't think, like, it's never going to be enough because we've been needing a lot of help from years and years. It's not something like now. So... Mm -hmm. I will say my answer, I think it's never going to be enough. Uh, and when, like Samantha was saying, when it comes to money, when it comes to help, it's it's more about like making sure it gets to the right hands uh, because that's, that's how are we gonna know that it's actually going to be helping us as Puerto Ricans. Otherwise, uh, if we're not keeping track of this, if no one is res like being responsible of making sure Puerto Rico gets, gets, actually gets this help, it's never going to be enough because it's going to keep losing track. And at the end of the day, it's we're going to be back and back and back. We're not going to be giving those steps forward to get better. Speaking of health, Natasha, what should the U.S. government and in particularly Chicago do to prepare for a, a similar event in the future? I think that it's a similar event will eventually happen, right? Because we're talking about climate change and the increased number of hurricanes and the category of the hurricanes that are coming. We need to establish a system to ensure that we are accurately documenting people's information when they're coming in, a comprehensive uh, portal where we're keeping track of individuals to ensure that they're getting the help that they need, making sure that we have a list of wide um, options for housing so that we are addressing individuals and families and their needs in addition to making sure that we have trauma-informed care with for mental health services for individuals that are coming in for domestic violence for individuals that are coming because of these natural disasters that are also be culturally competent that we're able to serve individuals in their language yes yeah, certainly there's still a lot to do my thanks to samantha elizabeth natasha and we're back with more Chicago tonight, right after this. A Chicago architect is using his love for design to teach the next generation of artists in a new virtual drawing class. Arts correspondent Angel Edo sat in on the class and shares more on its impact. It was while taking videos along the Chicago River while kayaking that architect Joel Berman got the initial idea to teach virtual drawing classes with Chicago architecture as the focal point. The subject has to be compelling and interesting or it's not worth drawing. Somebody has to be excited about what it is that they're creating. Now Berman has taught a number of art classes through the course of his career, encouraging people to draw formulaically. But this is his first ever virtual class with kids. I'm hoping that I'm bringing something to school children that they couldn't get from their school or they couldn't get from other art teachers. Using those videos he captured on the river and others of the city, Berman set up a five-week course for students ages 9 to 12. I participated in their class the second week where we learned about value. Value is darks and lights and different tones, different shades of darkness. And what we talk about is simplifying it. The simplification is 
breaking it down into three values, dark, light, and medium. Dark is black. Light is just nothing. And medium is in between. After this breakdown, we were encouraged to recreate one part of the image, keeping value in mind. Do you want to talk about the first one and why you chose it? Um, the first one is the bridge. For 11-year-old Julia Highsmith, it was an opportunity to further her curiosity in architecture. So what did you think when we took the class? Did you have fun? What has your experience been? I'm into um, architecture and I do a lot of building with Legos. I've never got to do an architecture class, so that's what got me interested. And my art classes at school, we would just usually work on like different styles, um, different types of art, like we did in the uh, class. He does the thumbnail art drawings, which I thought was really helpful for me because I got more into like shading. So then mom, what is it like for you seeing your daughter be able to pursue her interest as an architect uh, at such an early age? Julie being interested in architecture was something, um, she's been into Legos since what, one? So she could move, I think. <laughs> and um, I mean, growing up, people always said uh, when she went to Lego thing and the different conventions or things like that, people were saying like, oh, she should look into architecture because she's really good at building and dimensions and dynamics. She was super excited. Um, as soon as it closed out, she was like, that was so good. That was so fun. So that's the reaction that I was hoping for. Berman says he's eager to continue teaching the next generation of artists with the city as the main highlight. I hope I'm bringing something as an architect that they might not have been exposed to otherwise. Chicago right now is getting a bad rap. And there's so many great things about Chicago. I want the world to know what a great place we live in. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. Now, if you are interested in taking this class, good news. After seeing the success of this first five-week course, Berman plans to open it up to all ages. We have more information on our website. And that's our show for this Monday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7 Take a look at the politics of replacing Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the bench. And three black police officers on policing amid the racial justice movement. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe. Good night. Captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals. Thank you.